Hello, and welcome back to Off the Deep Path. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for April 11th, 2024. We are recording this week from the It Doesn't Feel Like Thursday department here at the Georgia Historical Society on the 15th floor of the Jepson House overlooking beautiful Forsyth Park in downtown Savannah. My special guest this week is David Henkin. David is Margaret Byrne Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his BA from Yale and his PhD from Cal Berkeley. He's the co-author of Becoming America, A History for the 21st Century, written with Rebecca McLennan, published by McGraw-Hill in 2015. He is also the sole author of three other books, The Postal Age, The Emergence of Modern Communications in 19th Century America, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2006. City Reading, Written Words in Public Spaces in Antebellum, New York, published by Columbia University Press in 1998. And his most recent book, and the one he is here to talk with me about today, entitled The Week, A History of the Unnatural Rhythms That Made Us Who We Are, published by Yale University Press in 2021. Longtime listeners of this podcast know that I'm fascinated by time, the passage of time, the ways that we measure it, the artificial nature of much of the way that we measure time. On November 15th, 2017, I talked about the time change that we all experience every autumn and all the things associated with it, including the way we mark the months and the years. On February 11th, 2021, I recorded a dispatch from Off the Deaton Path video about daylight saving time, where that came from, and what it would mean if we stayed on either daylight saving time or Eastern Standard Time all year long. When I heard about David Henkin's book, I knew I had to read it and talk to him about it, and I thoroughly enjoyed doing both things. He very kindly accepted my invitation to talk about his book, and I think that you will enjoy it too. My conversation with David Henkin about the week begins now. David Henkin, welcome to our podcast. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you're the author of the book, The Week, A History of the Unnatural Rhythms That Made Us Who We Are. And so my first thing, and you sort of started your entire book with this, and I only say this because it actually is Thursday, but why do we say to each other, you know, gosh, it it doesn't feel like Thursday. What is a day supposed to feel like? And how did that ever begin? That's a broad question to start this, but why do days have a certain feel? Right, so I I, I think of of, uh, of this really as a as a historical question, uh, the answer to which would vary from society to to society. I don't think we should take for granted that distinctive days had distinctive feels for everyone um, in a in a society. Uh, you can imagine a society in which everyone's day was completely different, which we often acknowledge. We ask people, well, "How's your day?" And uh, we assume that your day and my day are different, but but we do have some shared days, and um, uh, a shared day could be structured by the weather, right? If you, have, you know, the sun comes out every day, or or or, or it hides, uh, and then so we th- might think of our sharing a day uh, in that sense. Um, but also, we use the calendar to sort of coordinate our activities or to consecrate days uh, in various ways. Um, and um, most calendars that I know about do that. The weekly ca- calendar uh, <clears throat> has done that in a pretty striking way because uh, it, it does it in very short cycles. A seven day week, unlike the month or the year or you know, the season, et cetera, um, is really quite short. Um, it's the shortest recurring cycle of days that, that, that most of us live by. Uh, so that's one thing about it. And the other is that it's uh, organized around, uh, for many people, around cycles of work and rest. So so um, and when someone says it doesn't feel like a Wednesday or a Thursday, I always would have assumed uh, when I was growing up that they meant um, it doesn't feel like it has the same proximity to the last weekend or the next weekend, uh, as in fact it does, which is something that we often experience in the uh, say in the modern U.S., when there's a, a three day ho- three day weekend for a holiday, and we so oh, it feels different because I've only been you know it, I've been working for two days, and so it should feel like a Wednesday, but in fact it's Thursday, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I wondered whether there were other things also that gave the days of the week specifically, as opposed to the days of the month or the year, 
their, uh, their distinctive feel. And I also wondered whether the feeling that attaches to a day of the week <clears throat> is actually quite different from the things that attach to a day of the month or the year. And I think the answer to those questions turned out to, to be yes. And I, in this book, I try to figure out how, how that came to be. In other words, the answer to the first question is uh, there are things other than the distance from the weekend that make today feel like a Thursday for most of us, even if the feeling is not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and secondly, uh, that the feeling that attaches to the Thursdayness of today is much more powerful, especially much more powerful mnemonically and cognitively um, than, uh, than the grip of the fact that today is the 21st. Right. Um, for example, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we, we were chatting earlier and you were asking about my spring in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I said, well, actually, I think of, it, of us as still in the winter. And I had to I looked down at my computer to see that today is the 21st. And mm -hmm. I thought about the significance of the 21st with respect to, to the equinox. So, you know, that kind of sense of where we are in time weighs very loosely upon me. Um, but I knew it was Thursday, and I knew it was Thursday for all kinds of reasons that are not just about whether uh, whether um, we're approaching the weekend uh, or whether the weekend is just sort of receding into the rearview mirror. One of the things you make clear in your book, and you write out of the gate, is that the week, the seven-day week, is really, uh, in fact, you refer to it as the mysterious human artifice that is the seven-day week. This is totally man-made, right? Humans created the seven-day week. There is nothing natural about this. People have asked me who knew I was reading this book and said, oh, didn't the week come from the Bible? Because right there in Genesis, it's sort of laid out there. Right. Um, but even that was written, what, 2,000 years ago? Uh, the week was sort of firmly established by then, or was well, it? Well, I mean, yeah. Walk through that? The week with the Bible was written longer ago than that. So I, I would answer yeah. that question a couple ways. First of all, the fact that it's in the Bible doesn't make it not man-made, even if you believe that the that the Bible is not man-made, right? In other words, uh, if you think that God, in fact, um, uh, as many people do, uh, that God uh, created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, that doesn't create a week for human beings. That might be a model that some human beings might choose to follow. Uh, but that doesn't create a week. Also, you'll notice that in, in the Bible, God doesn't rest every seven days. God just rests on the seventh day. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in the Genesis account that even suggests that that ought to be a model for people to, to follow. That comes later later on in, in, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so, uh, right. So even, even if one takes it as a, as a historical event, if that's the right way to characterize it, that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, that doesn't get you a week. Uh, a week happens when people, uh, some of whom saw themselves as, as, as acting on, on a divine model, uh, um, decided to regularly uh, count cycles of seven days. Uh, so that's the human artifice. And, and how old that is is a matter of debate, I think. Um, I think the, sort of the scholarly consensus would put it to a, about 2,000 years uh, maybe a, a little longer that that societies began to use the week as a calendar system. Um, presumably, there are people who observed rest days uh, in various intervals and various degrees of coordination before that. But that also doesn't get you a week. A week is a uh, the te technology of the week involves a society coordinating or even just a community coordinating around a calendar system that says we are going to count every seven days, not just um, the, the seventh and 14th and 21st day of a lunar month, but every seven days, it's going to be a continuous count. And we're always going to know where we are in that count. And we're going to use that count uh, to mark time, um, to plan events, uh, to impose rules, etc. cetera. Um, so if you understand the week that way, I would say that the week really is about 2,000 years old. Mm -hmm. um, in your subtitle of your book, A History of the Unnatural Rhythms, what is the unnatural referring to there? Is it what we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, un, un, by unnatural, I don't mean what's, what some people might mean, but I don't actually believe this either. Uh, uh, it's not just that I don't mean it. Um, that uh, it is contrary to our nature mm. to rest every seven days. I don't think it's contrary to our nature. I just think it's not dictated by our nature. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that are not natural. It doesn't mean they're bad for us or that they estrange us from the natural world. Um, uh, 
I mean, the seven day week is not rooted in the natural world and it attunes us to things other than the natural world. I don't necessarily think that makes it bad uh, or, that, or, that, or that it's alienating in, in, in any way, but it does show us that many of the most powerful uh, controls over our experience of time um, are rooted in social convention rather than in astronomy or biology. And that's, you know, the, the significance of that, I, I, I'm somewhat agnostic about, but, but, uh, but I think that's an important fact. Yeah, you, you raised the point in your book, and I confess, as fascinated as I am with the passage of time and how we mark it and how really manipulated it is. Um, we're going to talk about, in a minute, I'm going to get you to explain how 13 days just disappeared in 1752, right, in, the, in, in what is now the United States. Um, but you, you say at one point, and I want to quote you here, to say today is Tuesday is to make a claim about the past rather than the stars or the tides or the weather. We are asserting that a certain number of days reckoned by uninterrupted counts of seven separate today from some earlier moment. And I had never really thought about the fact that there's this some unknown time in the past when people started counting days of the week and we're continuing it to say that this Thursday, last Thursday, and you know, goes back as far as you want to. And 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 I had never thought about that. It's an extra it seems an extraordinary thing to, to claim. It's, it's, it's fascinating true. to me. It, it's an aspect of the uh, of the week that's particularly interesting to me. And I I've noticed it tends not to be what other people find fascinating about. So I'm 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 uh, uh, entertained and gratified that that, that you share it. Uh, maybe it's be, it's because we're we're historians. Um uh, the infrastructure that preserves the week is essentially a historical one because it's mm. it's about record keeping. Um, you know, Robinson Crusoe uh, in Defoe's novel loses his week uh, because there's nowhere to look for it other than in written records, and he doesn't have written records, so he produces his own written record, which turns out to be false, mm -hmm. right? Um, it turns out, you know, he he called. Uh, yep. He calls him Friday. He should he should have called him Saturday. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's it's really it's really tenuous. You know, if 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 you if you if your record keeping isn't solid, you won't have the right day. And the only way to prove to someone else that their day is wrong is to go back into the archives, to go back into the, the documentation, and somehow prove to them that they lost track somewhere. And so it's interesting that uh, no religious sects. Um, um, and no, and no rival religions have ever really disagreed with one another. I mean, they all, often fight about the calendar. They even fight about the natural calendar, uh, but um, they don't disagree as to where we are in the count. Uh, and if they did, it would, it would, it would be very easy to, to remain entrenched in one's, in one's position because n nothing someone else could show you. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess you, you could, I, I mean, I, 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 if, if you, if, if you really thought that today, today, today were Wednesday, and um, we lived in a more a sort of a scribal society, I, I guess I would try to, to, to persuade you by going back and finding some record, and then trying to create a continuous count of days. It would be really, really hard to prove to someone. Mm -hmm. That uh, that they were wrong. Uh, yeah. So I, I that makes all the more remarkable that no one has ever uh, claimed that someone was wrong because it'd be very easy to, to sort of get away with that claim. Yeah. yeah and these days, and we, I don't want to jump ahead and get to the very end of the book where you talk about really the future of the week in the in our digital age. But as we all know now, it's as simple as tapping on your phone, and if your phone says it's Friday, then it must be because right a satellite right. has, has no, told I'd, it. No, I'd be I mean I'd be surprised if many people do. I feel people tap on their phone to find out the date. But mm -hmm. I feel like people usually go they know what day it is. Some pretty strong. Com I mean, the time will come where that's not the case, perhaps. But mm -hmm. I, I still think I live in a world where people don't tap on their phones to find the day of the week, and if they do, it's to confirm something that they're ninety nine percent sure of. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's today, Tuesday or Wednesday. It's my meeting, right? right? What what yeah. day is my meeting this week? Um, you you take us through in this book chronologically, and and you very you you say that you you are a, this is a a history of the United States and the way that the week has been has been marked here, um, and um, it it began of course in the early New England period with the Sabbath being important, right? And and the the it's sort of everything being marked between a day of rest and then the Sabbath. Um, but it, it really changes at some point to where the seven days be, kind of become unmoored from a day of worship, I think, where Sunday is not 
is just another day of the week, right? And some and that happens. You 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 say that in the early 19th century is a very important time in the history of the week. What happened then that made that so? Yeah, I actually I I, I don't sort of see it so much as people caring less about whether it was Sunday. They still they disagreed about the meaning of Sunday and they fought about what ought to be the rules. But mm -hmm. Sunday was really really important to virtually everyone free or enslaved in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. I think what changed was that people had more reasons to care whether it was Tuesday or Wednesday, not just whether it was a weekday or or, or, or Sunday. And uh, there are a bunch of different changes and sort of, um, you know, I, I think maybe it's more useful to sort of try to catalog them or imagine some examples, but a lot of them do have to do with urbanization, um, with the spread of print culture, uh, and uh, with the spread of coordinated activities like schooling um, and uh, commercial entertainment. So you note that newspapers, particularly in the 19th century, being printed um, weekly and right. on the same day every week played a tremendously important role in sort of solidifying the week's importance in the lives of Americans. Can you can you tell our, our listeners about that? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh there were daily newspapers in the United States, but the overwhelming majority of newspapers and the overwhelming majority of newspaper reading experiences were attached to weekly papers. Um, uh, now, some of those papers were Sunday papers, and some of the most popular one, popular uh, daily papers were Sunday editions of the daily papers. Uh, but most weekly papers didn't had no relation to Sunday. They were printed on whatever day of, of the week the publisher chose. Um, and often they were received on whatever day of the week the post office managed to deliver it. Uh, so, you know, uh, for lots of people, the day when news or, 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 um, or news entertainment arrived would be determined not exactly or not strictly by, by publication day, but by, but by mail delivery day, uh, mm -hmm. depending how far one lived from the, from the city publication or depending on how often one got mail. A lot of people in very rural areas in the early 19th century got their mail once a week also. There are a lot of things that happened once a week and also a lot of things that happened multiple times a week but on the same days of the week. So for example, uh, theater matinees on Wednesday and Sunday, uh, half school day uh, on Wednesday and Saturday rather, half school days also Wednesday and Saturday. A bi-weekly paper might um, print on Tuesday and Friday. A bank might do a certain kind of business on Monday and Thursday. Uh, lots more of those things where you actually had to know what day of the, we had, you had uh, inducements uh, to pay attention to what day of the week it was and your experience of those days of the week would differ. So once more people had Tuesday experiences that were different from Wednesday experiences, uh, whereas they didn't have uh, differentiated experiences between the 15th day of a Gregorian month and the 16th day, in any memorable way, mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, you really do know the difference between, you know what day of the week it is, you care about it, um, and then suddenly Tuesday has a feel. Tuesday might not have the same feel for you and for me if we read different newspapers or if we are on different mail schedules or if we uh, go to different kinds of theaters or, or banks or, or, or if we have, you know, uh, Spanish lessons or singing clubs or temperance society. So it's not that uh, Tuesday means the same thing necessarily for you and for me. But what's important is that both for you and for me, Tuesday feels different from, from, from Wednesday. And, and, uh, and that's a very modern phenomenon. And I think that was not typical experience in North America, let's say before 1800. And by, by the middle of the 1800s, I think that was a fairly typical experience, especially for people who didn't live um, in, you know, on farms, but even for many people who did. And even for people who, who, who were enslaved on farms, uh, uh, then it was less likely to be about, about newspapers or commercial entertainment, but it would often be about patterns of release from work. Sometimes it would be even patterns of food. Sometimes it would be more reinforced by things like folklore. The problem is that there are many, many things going on, I discovered, in people's uh, lives and heads uh, that use the technology of the week. So I, it's, I'm always a little reluctant to say that it was this particular social development or this particular application of the weekly technology that made people care. But the cumulative effect of all of these, especially um, for literate people living in cities, uh, was, uh, was overwhelming.
before I get into the nuts and bolts of asking you about the, the Gregorian calendar and changing over to that, how did you, David Henkin, get interested in the week as a concept? So um, I would say a couple of different ways. One is uh, I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish home where the weekly calendar was was uh, structured uh, mostly through the best Sabbath restrictions, but also in generally through liturgy and other things. The weekly calendar was pretty prominent. Um, but I always noticed that everyone around me who did not live that way, uh, who did not who was, did not live in that religious um, world, also seemed to care about the week. So I was always curious about about you know how that came to be. Um, secondly, I would say I'm um, generally speaking as a historian interested in what I think of as low tech or as unspectacular technologies uh, that help produce the modern world that didn't require a major invention often involved the um, new applications of very old technologies, things like writing, or in this case, uh, you know, uh, artificial uh, timekeeping and, and weekly cycles. Uh, but the nonetheless, I feel, um, are central to how uh, modern subjects feel connected to one another. So in a way, this project fits in with a lot of other projects that have interested me. And then finally, I would say that by studying the ordinary lives of um, people in a uh, I was going to say the everyday experience, but this this project taught me to to be a little bit uh, cautious about the word everyday, since no no two consecutive <laughs> days are, are alike. Um, but what, what what we call the everyday experiences of people in nineteenth century America, um, I just began to notice how many things, uh, how many times they they spoke about the day of the week and how many things they did on a weekly basis. So I say there's a, like a long term answer was the first one about my upbringing, um, the sort of intellectual con. Uh, I, answer really is about the way uh, the kinds of projects interest me. And then third, it was a little bit driven by my, uh, just my, uh, my encounter with, with, uh, with the archive over the last uh, 30, 35 years. So. When, when you told people, whether, whether it was colleagues who there are themselves historians or lay people who are not historians, what are, you, what, are you, what are you working on, David? And you said, I'm writing a book about the week. What kind of reaction did you get? Well, the first thing is, and um, this came up Earlier in my career, when I was working on the mail, I had to spell the word for them. Because if you tell people you're working on the mail, they assume you're talking about masculinity. If you, and if you tell people you're working on the week, they assume you're thinking about uh, subaltern peoples and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and resistance to domination by mm -hmm. the spot. So that's the first thing I had to do, is I had, had, to, had, to, always had to spell the word. Um, and in this project in particular, I definitely, you know, I, I mostly write about things that, um, that uh, other scholars, uh, of 19th century America, at least initially, think of as sort of oblique to their primary interests, um, because it's not about state building and it's not about uh, it's not about racial capitalism and it's 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 not about um, it's not about party politics and it's not about class conflict and it's uh, and it's not about settler colonialism. Things that I love to teach about, but but I don't necessarily think need to constrain our research agendas as scholars. So they always have that, like, huh, I've never thought about that, huh, hmm. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, you know, then, then when you explain it, they say, oh, yeah, actually, you know, I've, uh, uh, lay people, um, I think, were much more immediately, uh, uh, you know, uh, intrigued by the topic. Mm -hmm. Because um, most lay people, for starters, ha uh, don't assume that that's a historical question, um, but are, but are easily persuaded that it is because they don't have uh, the same expectations of what of what historical questions might look like. But also, most uh, people that I spoke to um, hadn't thought about the fact that the week is artificial. That's usually where their interest begins. Mm -hmm. But then they would assume that my book is trying to sort of prove that it's artificial, whereas I sort of feel like that's kind of been done. Uh, um, and on, there are plenty of books out, out there that could persuade them of that. Uh, instead, I have to explain that, um, uh, that, that I'm trying to show how it came, that we came to assume somewhat different functions in the modern world than, than it may have in other societies. And then the other thing uh, that for both, um, it's actually true both for historians and for, and, for, and for lay people, the assumption is that the history of the week is about the history of the weekend. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, um, almost everyone I w uh, would speak to about it in academic life would assume that I was writing about um, 
uh, Sabbath observance or fights about proper observance of Sunday. Um, and again, that's an interesting question, but uh, that has been written about quite a bit. Uh, and we know a lot about it. And that's a, in some ways a less interesting fun, fundamental question to me. Uh, once, once you have a society that takes for granted that there's a week and that there should be a weekend and that the, uh, then that the weekend should be different from the rest of the week. In other words, once, once you take for granted that there is a bimodal dominical structure for seven day timekeeping, then the question of what you do about it, um, you know, becomes sort of almost an inside baseball kind of kind of question. Whereas I'm I'm taking a step back and saying, well, you know, where does this where does this infrastructure uh, develop in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 what kinds of things does it do other than the most obvious, which is to to uh, to separate to separate seven days into six tick what I call six ticks and a talk. Uh, uh, whereas in fact, this seven day week also does something else, which is it separates do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Uh, and, you know, it separates seven things that are irreducibly different um, and that can't actually be uh, jumbled together or, or fractionalized in any obvious way. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of cool things about, about the, seven, the seven day week that um, people get interested in when, when they start to think about it, but their initial response is always, always assumes that it's about the bimodal week weekday weekend mm -hmm. profane sacred labor leisure work and, and you make it clear and there's a you, you said and i quote here well, weeks do all kinds of complicated work for us much of which relates indirectly if at all to the cycle of work and rest so this isn't just about the days you work and the days you don't right right yeah um you you also pose this you say whether most people living in the u.s two centuries ago and I think you mean the early 19th century, knew or cared if it was Tuesday is an important question that never gets posed, which I also thought was interesting. Yeah. First of all, why is it important and why doesn't it ever get posed? I think it doesn't get posed for some combination of the fact that uh, um, this is a little bit, so let me sound a little contradictory. We, ass we usually assume that, that they knew because we assume that Tuesday was real, so they must have known, right? You know, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. like they knew it was day or night, but we don't think that through, but uh, right. instinctively. And on the other hand, we assume that all they would have cared about is whether it was Sunday or not. And therefore, um, we assume they know and we assume they wouldn't have, have, have really cared, apart from the question of, of its relationship to Sunday. Um, but to me, it seemed like a, an open, real question for any society. You could imagine a society in which people don't really know that it's Tuesday, and you could imagine a society in which they know but don't really care, or don't really care except in relationship to mm -hmm. Sunday. So I set about to try to figure out uh, whether most people knew, and I'm, I'm arguing yes, uh, and, and also that they cared, um, and that they cared for reasons that were not limited to relationship to Sunday, though... Obviously, relationship to Sunday mattered, and relationship to Sunday sometimes set up the structures for the activities that made them care about about Tuesday. So, for example, if someone cared about Wednesday because they had a, a slightly different schedule um, in school or in, even in the theater, one could argue that the reason they have that schedule is because Wednesday is a distant day from 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 Sunday. But that doesn't mean that they care about Wednesday just because of that distance. Mm -hmm. They care about Wednesday because they get out of school early, or they care about Wednesday because they're going to go to the theater, uh, or they care about Wednesday because they're going to go to the bank, or they care about the Wednesday because their minister is least likely to be available to them. But that's not the same as saying that they care about it because the weekend is approaching or receding or distant or approximate. You know, historians almost never, when they're writing narrative history, they almost never use days of the week. Um, they will say something happened on July 4th, 1776, and then by the 27th, this happened, or if they're just, you know, military events happen. It's again, as you said, it's a day in the Gregorian calendar. Um, I had a conversation with Rick Atkinson, who is well known to people for having written the trilogy on World War II. And in his, his first book on the revolution, what struck me about it was he would say, Washington received his dispatch on Saturday, and on Tuesday he moved out yeah. without any sense of what it was the 15th or the 18th. And it made all the difference because I thought, that's how we live our lives. It was very powerful, and I talked to him about it. He said that was a conscious decision. Any sense of why historians don't do that more? 
Yes, um, uh, I do actually have, have an answer to that. So I, uh, I, I found, for example, if, if you look at uh, people's um, diary accounts and their memoir accounts of the same event, they will narrate them differently. They'll use dates mm. in the memoir and they'll use weekdays in the diary. So one explanation is uh, <clears throat> the week is especially useful for narrating and actually for remembering recent events. I mean, it's a short time cycle. Um, and it, it, it can help you figure out the relationship of one recent event to another recent event. And that's increasingly in the 19th century, how people remembered stuff. Oh, this happened on Wednesday. Um, because there are all these other things you can attach to all these like mnemonic hooks. Oh, I know it was Wednesday, because, you know, that was the day that 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 that, um, that I bake pies. Right. Um, we see this in, 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 in court cases also. The court report would use the Gregorian dates because that's the official historical record. And maybe it took place a long time ago. But if you get someone up there and really uh, are testing their memory, they're going to rely on days of the week. So people, witnesses in courts I, is one of the cool things that I that I um, explore in the book. Witnesses in courts tended to uh, uh, remember days of the week week more confidently and more accurately than they were, they remembered dates. So when you have to remember something, um, it's really useful to, so that's one, one answer. I and mean, get further from, from, from the event, even if the week, they might have some personal mnemonic value for you, but especially if you're writing impersonally about an event where you weren't there, uh, the, the utility of, of, of the, of the week isn't there. And so you rely on the on an official numerical record um, that can be uh, uh, put in subsets of, of, of larger units. The week is not actually a, um, a perfect uh, subset of any larger unit of time. Whereas the day is part of a month and a month is part of a year and a year is part of a decade and a century and a millennium and stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and when you could do that from, you know, for, from a second all the way to, to millennium, but the week has fractions, but is not itself a fraction, right? So, uh, so, um, so the week isn't r super convenient for creating long-term annals or, 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 or records of things. Now, when uh, Rick Atkins wants to, or any historian wants to, to narrate a short time frame event and give you the sense of the experience of it, um, then, uh, then the weekday is much more compelling. If I say this happened on the 24th and this happened on the 26th, I mean, you can figure it out, but that's not yeah. actually, uh, from a reader's perspective, as like, well, this was Tuesday and this was Thursday. And that, that, really, that really does, does capture it. So I'd say, yeah, so the weekday is good for remembering and for narrating recent events. And it's good for putting a reader in the frame of mind of the actors, but we tend not to do it, except when it happens to make a, uh, some sort of difference, which it, it, so I'll just give you an example. Most people don't know when, what day of the week, July 4th, 1776 was. Do, do you happen to know? Right. I do know. Yeah. Okay. It was a Tuesday. No, it was not. Was it not? No. What day <laughs> was it? What it day was, was it? <laughs> uh, so right, because it does, we, we think it doesn't matter. Most people do know what day of the week uh, Lincoln was shot on. Um, yeah. Right. Right. Because it it happened to be a a Friday that was significant in, mm -hmm. in the Christian calendar. Sometimes, for other reasons, we know when the New York City draft riots began because it makes sense that they began on a Monday. They knew in advance that the that the that the draft lottery would take place on on a, but and they had that opportunity to plan. So sometimes we know the day because it's sort of it's it's part of the story. But mostly we think of it as not part of the story. And and maybe it, it wasn't, but you know, on July fourth, uh, people in Philadelphia knew what day of the week it was. Whether we care about it is, I think, a real question. I, I could I, I could see an argument that says that we don't, because the significance of July fourth is not really about the temporal experience or the mental map of of you know John Hancock or whoever. It's really about um, when that document was circulated, performed, commemorated, sanctified, etc. 
it attached to that numerical Gregorian date, and that's what matters. And if the day of the week wasn't part of that story, then it shouldn't be part of our memory. I'm like, I, 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 it doesn't, it, it doesn't bother me that that people yeah. don't know what day. The, of, what of what the day week. was it? I was wrong. I, what day? I, was I, it? I believe it was Thursday. So. Was it <laughs> Tuesday or Thursday? Yeah. And Tuesday in in modern culture sort of has a, a reputation as being kind of a nothing day, right? It's one of those days you just get through to get to the middle of the week, as you say. Right. It's all building toward a weekend now. Um, so much to talk about. I want to sort of clip through some of this real quick. Tell our readers, a uh, lot readers, our listeners about Americans adopting, well, in the British Empire, I guess, adopting the Gregorian calendar in 1752. We we think that, okay, we can manipulate the clock twice a year, right, in, in the spring and the fall and falling back, et cetera. But days have been manipulated, too. Whole days have just been gone. Right. And most people have no idea that this ever happened. Right, though, significantly, when, when, when the British Empire um, uh, uh, adopted the Gregorian calendar for, for its colonies, um, the uh, weekdays didn't disappear, only dates did. In other words, <laughs> right, uh, right. We, we, like we, we, we skipped ahead in, in, in the monthly calendar, but we didn't skip ahead uh uh in 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 the in in the weekly calendar so which which means that yes the we we still believe we have a continuous weekly count from whenever and, and until now but but we don't have a continuous calendar in any other way so um i don't know how much detail i'll, I'll try to do this quickly the uh the gregorian uh, pope gregory a, a you know a, a lot earlier than than the 18th century mm-hmm. uh um authorized a calendar tweak that was designed to uh, uh, adjust for the fact that the solar year is not 365.25 days long. It's actually 365.24, more or less. That, that's, that'd be the, the, the nearest decimal. So, so if you have a leap year every four years, the year is going to drift forward with respect to real solar time. Mm-hmm. And doesn't matter much in someone's lifetime, but it matters over the over, over the course of centuries, and it will create problems for the reckoning of Easter, and more generally, it would be it would be I mean you know uh, maybe in an era of, of of climate change we're we're sort of prepared for this, but it would feel weird to have fundamentally different weather associations from that of our ancestors. And in any case, mostly dr- I think driven by by concerns about about Easter, Pope Pope Gregory. Um, authorized the tweak, which is, as you uh, may remember, in 2000 we did uh, we didn't we had a sorry we did have a leap year. 2000 weird. Uh, as neither you and I remember, in 1900 we didn't have a leap year, despite mm-hmm. the fact that, that it was. Uh, so the tweak is that every hundred years you skip the leap year when it would otherwise happen, but every 400 years you don't skip the leap year. So in 2000 we had February 29th, but in 2100 we will not. Okay, that minor tweak gets us back on track, but it had to be retroactively, um, you know, uh, uh, calculated. So, so they, they did that uh, in the 17, in, in the 1750s, they, they sort of skipped forward to account for the, the, the missing days going back to the beginning of the Julian calendar. The other thing they did, which is sort of interesting, is they uh, switched when the year begins. So um, yes. I remember when, when I was a kid, uh, um, when I was, we were learning something in math about about logarithms i i i it was pointed out that the uh square root of um of 3 is 1.732 and the mnemonic for that was that was the year that george washington was born and that is the year that we would say george washington was born but george washington thought he was born in 1733 mm-hmm. sorry, in, uh, sorry in 1731 31, right, mm-hmm. the year before. Right, because um, in 17, in what we would call 1732, the year began in March, not in January, right? So if you're yeah. born on February 22nd, and then we're not even talking about adjusting for what, what his birthday would be. Uh, uh, people in, um, in the Soviet Union went through this as well, because they, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church adopted the, the Gregorian didn't had not adopted the Gregorian calendar, and so they would have old dates and new dates. Um, the sig- only significance of this for my book is 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 really just it it, it shows you uh, uh, in some ways how not firm other calendar systems were. Uh, that you know you could really disagree about what the date was, 
Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but people didn't disagree about what day of the week it was. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened in 1752? People went to bed uh, on whatever day, Tuesday, September 2nd, right? And then they woke up and it was 11 days later. It was still Wednesday, as you pointed out. Right. But 11 days had disappeared. It was the 13th or something like right. that. So if, if, you know, um, <laughs> we, we get a bent out of shape when we when we move the clocks forward. But, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would, it would be interesting if, if we were to if we, if we were advanced 11 days now, it would have all kinds of complications for uh, rent and salary mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. accounting and and schedule. Quote, Birthdays. Right? I mean, right. yeah. Yeah. You, you'd miss your birthday. Uh, yeah. But as you say, so we built in, you know, this hundred year thing that will fix that so that they don't have to do it again. But the the fact that it happened and everybody just sort of went along with it after yeah. a while, finally, um, is fascinating to me. And just so people understand what we're talking about with the time of the year started until this happened, people celebrated March 1st as the new year. Right. That was the beginning of the new year, not January 1st. Right. Yeah. M- most yeah. people. I mean, yeah. In, 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 in the in the colonies, official. Mm-hmm. Right. The other thing that you talk about in your book, which is also interesting, um, I have to say one of the one of the most stunning things was the way that Friday was always viewed up to a certain point um, very negatively. People didn't want to get married on Friday. Friday was not seen as a day that good things happened. You refer to it as Friday fatalism. In fact, you say, and this is really interesting, in New York State, every single hanging between 1800 and 1825 took place on Friday. Yeah. How did Friday get such a bad rap? Well, I, I, I assume that Friday gets a bad rap um, um, in Christian societies because of the crucifixion. Mm-hmm. That's the origin of it. But, you know, there were a lot of people who had no theological attachment to the crucifixion who nonetheless thought of it as a bad luck day. And there were lots of people who thought of the crucifixion as the, the most blessed event in you know, in history, mm-hmm. because it's, 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 it, it's, it's what, you know, uh, the crucified body of Christ enabled the resurrection, enabled all our salvation. So Friday should, Friday should be a good Friday as, as mm-hmm. people insist every year. So, so, um, so I don't think it's exactly about theology, but presumably it's rooted in, um, mm. uh, in, in some Christian ideas about, I mean, you know, so uh, Catholic practices of not having certain kinds of foods or meat on Friday also you know, so 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 if the question is why Friday, I think the answer, the shortest answer is Christianity. But uh, if the question is why are there good and bad luck days attached to the week, I would say that m- m- many, many societies that we know about um, have what I call in the book a humorological conception of time, which is that the calendar can be understood as a grid of auspicious and inauspicious days, sometimes in really complicated ways. Right, they're weird patterns. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, but sometimes in fairly straightforward, straightforward ways. Uh, you know, a, a, a new moon could be a good day or a bad day, that kind of thing. Um, the uh, experience of weekly time in North America was uh, was uh, in part humorological, though I do think that that it receded. Uh, the other source of, of, of hemorology for the seven days, apart, uh, apart from Christianity, though, would be the Roman Planetary Week. So the Roman Planetary Week, which is the other, apart from the Jewish Sabbath week, is the other source of seven-day weeks in, in, in Western history. The Roman Planetary Week was not a cycle of work and rest. It was an astrological, let's say, cycle, because it assigned dominion uh, to each day in the cycle to one of the five visible planets or the sun and the moon. And that's in fact where we get the name for most of our weekdays and in, in for actually all of all of our weekdays in most European uh, uh, languages and most of our weekdays in even more languages. Uh, so Sunday is for the sun and Monday is for the moon and Tuesday is for Mars and Wednesday is, is, is for Mercury. The uh, Germanic languages use the Norse gods rather than the Roman ones, but it's still the same planets. Mm-hmm. Thursday is uh, today is the day of Jupiter. Um, tomorrow is the day of Venus. Now, that doesn't tell you why Friday was a bad luck day, because I don't think Venus was necessarily thought to be a bad planet. Mm-hmm. But it does w- once you think of the s- seven days of the week as attached to um, the fates 
controlled by the stars, it's easy to imagine why a seven day week would have good and bad days, right? Um, again, it doesn't tell you why, why, why Friday. Uh, fr Friday now is thought of as a good day because we focus so much on, on, um, on, on the, the week as a structure of work and rest. So we thank God when it is Friday. But, but, um, <laughs> but there is one vestige of it in popular culture, which is the idea of uh, Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. so the unlucky number and the unlucky day of the week. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of converge in uh, horror film culture and other places right. uh, mm -hmm. to give us that. So it's not a totally lost concept. It's just that uh, um, our, our sense of gratitude for the end of the week overwhelms our fear that Friday is a, is a bad luck day. Um, but yeah, I, did... I did find lots of evidence in 19th century America that people did think of Friday as a bad luck day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of weddings happening a lot on Saturdays now, right? Because people aren't working. It's the time when they can come. But as you point out, most are, most Weddings traditionally in America happened, I think, on Thursday. Was that the day? Yeah, I, 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 uh, uh, in, I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to know. A lot of people good, good, got married, and I didn't study everywhere, but I took samples of, of counties and showed that Thursday was all in all those was the had the plurality of weddings, and in some cases had the majority. The more striking thing I found was that Sunday was neither at the top or the bottom. Mm -hmm. You would think that the structure of the weekend or the schedule of ministers or something would make Sunday either be a taboo day or a favored day. And it was not the tab biggest taboo day was was Friday and the most and the most common day was Thursday. So um, I, I don't I don't want to make too much of that fact other than just to, to show a, a, more examples of ways in which people experience the difference of days as not simply being about weekday and weekend. Mm -hmm. And then I, yeah. I looked at, at marriages just because it's, it's, it is one of, the, uh, it's probably the single most documented scheduled activity uh, that people did in 19th century America, since they, they didn't typically schedule their births or deaths. And those are the only two activities that are, that are better documented. So. Mm -hmm. I want to talk for a minute about um, maybe the future of the week. Uh, one of the really interesting conversations I've long heard about this movement toward a 13 month calendar uh, uh you know, right where where there's this 13 months of 28 days what i didn't know was that um you know that goes all the way back to edward bellamy's book looking backward which was published in 1887 and then you have a whole conversation about the international fixed calendar yeah. Um, and I was fascinated as to where that 13th month would go. I always assumed it would be the end of December. And at least Bellamy's idea was no, let's or or no, maybe it's in the international uh, fixed calendar. It it fits in between June and July. Is that right? Yeah, Can I you... mean, uh, I, I actually haven't thought too much about where the 13th month ought to go or would go. Because uh, to me, it seems like, you know, the, the stakes of that are... are are practically speaking kind of small. I mean, it, it would be weird for birthdays and anniversaries <laughs> and, and, and all that. Uh, yeah. I mean, the Jewish calendar uh, does have, have, have a 13 month, seven times every 19 years. Uh, so the idea of, uh, and there are other calendars that we know about that use 13 months. So, so the number 13 isn't that odd. It, 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 would, re it would require that. But the truth is that the, that the calendar reform movement of the 19th century didn't always involve adding a 13 month. What it always sought to do was to make the week a, an even subset of the year. And a 13 month uh, calendar is a good way to do it because, you know, 13, 52, et cetera. Um, but a lot of the calendars that were proposed actually didn't uh, add a month. They actually just, uh, um, they, they kept 12 months, uh, but they, they added, they added uh, what were called extra hebdomadal days. Uh, they typically involved creating a 364 day calendar, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a 364 day calendar would, uh, would give you the situation where March 21st, will, let's say, will always be a Thursday. But in order to achieve that, you have to have the extra, extra day at the end or extra two days if, if, if it's a leap year. And so those days have to have no weekly value. They have to stand <laughs> outside the week, which isn't all that inconvenient. In fact, it's much less disruptive in a way than adding a 13 month, 13th month. 
And it's much less inconvenient than all the problems that we have when, when someone says, oh, I'll meet you on, let's meet, get together on Thursday the, the 22nd, and you realize that there is no Thursday the 22nd. Well, the, the amount of time that we spend, even, even in this age of electronic computing, sometimes figuring out what the relationship is between the Gregorian date and the weekly day, which are completely independent calendars, mm -hmm. uh, all that would be saved, and especially it would be saved for purposes of accounting and bookkeeping, and, and a big American business was, was very much behind this reform. But the ref reform went nowhere. It had a lot of momentum and a lot of influential supporters, but um, uh, I'd say by the 1930s, it was pretty much doomed, even though I would say, you know, if, 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 if someone were observing the situation in the 19 teens or 1920s, they would have assumed that it would have, was going to prevail. Um, I think they also would have thought so in the 1880s or the 1890s in, in, in Western Europe, um, in the US and even in, in other places, but it didn't go anywhere. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time talking about um, all the various factors that contributed to its defeat other than just to characterize the resistance as taking two forms. One was religious, uh, which is people uh, who believed that the weak was, um, was fixed essentially by its historical relationship to the creation of the world or to the resurrection or to earlier observances of the Sabbath or, or to something else. And this could be true for Islam and for Judaism and Christianity. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're justifiably worried that if they continued to celebrate their week out of sync with the rest of society, it would essentially isolate them or it would lead to Sabbath breaking. Um, the, the Jews more worried it would leave them out of sync and the Christians mm -hmm. more, more worried that they would, they would synchronize, but, but, uh, but that some of them thought that would, that would be um, religiously problematic. Uh, but there was another kind of resistance from people who were not uh, necessarily attached to um, Sabbatarian ideas about the week. And that was just, it, today is Thursday. You can't tell me it's not, you know, whereas, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, we've tweaked the months and dates before. Mm -hmm. uh, we've never tweaked the week. And I think it just felt to people like you can't have a day that stands outside the week. And then two days later, tell me that, Tell me that it's, it's, it's like Friday. It. Yeah. yeah. And to be clear for our listeners, an extra abdominal day to make this calendar work would be a day. And, and as you explained it, at like a day at the end of December, an additional day after June in leap years that literally like today is is the if today were the 28th and these are all 28 month, uh, 28 day months, there would be an extra day that literally wouldn't have a number and it wouldn't have a name. Right. Yeah. It would be a 24 yeah. hour time period. It would be a holiday. I mean, I, I, you know, <laughs> It doesn't seem so crazy to me that we could deal with that because we deal with that with holidays all the time. Mm -hmm. But when the holiday is over, we somehow expect the continuous count to resume, even though in some ways it might feel more normal. You know, after, so, you know, uh, we're, uh, after President's, the last Monday holiday we had, after, after pre President's weekend Monday, the next day was Tuesday. And all that week, a lot of us felt a little bit like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what if on that day we just said it's today is President Day, and then the next day was Monday? Would that have been <laughs> the big? I mean, in terms of our our, yeah. our body clocks, uh, mm -hmm. but no, that seems that seems un, unthinkable and unreal. And I guess instinctively to me also, it's just it's just uh, it's not entirely rational right. um, unless you are attached for religious or sentimental or historical reasons to the idea that we have had a continuous count of seven day cycles for you know, for the extent of the his historical record. And we would be breaking that. And what would you do with the people who were born on those days? Because somebody would be born on those days, but it wouldn't have a date and it wouldn't have a name. Well, it, it could have a date. You could, you, you, you could call it leap day or you could call it, mm. Mm -hmm. right. Or you yeah. could call it, the, you, you could even, if you wanted to call it December 29th, or you could, <laughs> I mean, there, there are yeah. many things you, you yeah. could call it. It, it, it would be an, an, an anniversary. I don't, I don't think that would be a problem. I think, uh, and 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 the fact that your your birth your day of birth didn't have a weekly value, I don't think that's too disruptive. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know what day of the week they were born on. That's um, absolutely true. They so, really don't. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so what you're saying is this: it, this divorce from the day of the week is more unsettling than the fact that it might not. It would be December 29th or leap yeah. day or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you you spend the last chapter, or really you're you're at the very end after your last chapter, talking about is the week in danger? Has our digital age 
are we dislodging ourselves? People talk about a digital Sabbath now, right? Where we take a break from our technology. Um, but ultimately, um, the question I'll, I'll ask you here is, is, is the week as we know it going to survive? I mean, m m my guess is yes. Um, but my book does give us some reasons <laughs> to, to wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you think of the week as fun, if you think of the, of, of the week as dictated by natural time rhythms, either biological or astronomical, or if you think of the week as essentially just a structure for, for, um, for pacing work and, and rest, uh, then, you know, the ch some of the changes uh, in our, let's call it a digital world, uh, uh, wouldn't necessarily dislodge it, um, ex right? Except for the fact that we have twenty four seven accessibility, and that 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 is 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 a big deal. But if um, but if you think of of the week also as a technology for coordinating activities with, among strangers, which is what I argue it became in the nineteenth century in the U.S., mm -hmm. then you might think that that it's a little bit less necessary. Uh, uh, or, or at least a little bit less relevant. I'll give you a couple of examples of, of te technological-ish changes that, that, that ought to make a difference. One is um, uh, asynchronous entertainment. For many people from the, from the 19th century when uh, theater matinees were scheduled on particular days to the 20th century when radio and then television shows were, were uh, attached to days, a lot of people's sense of their schedule and the feel of a Thursday was determined by synchronized entertainment. Um, so now, um, with one colossal exception, which is spectator sports, which has preserved that in a really powerful way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm talking to someone in, 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 in Georgia where the, for a big part of the year, the feeling of both fr Friday, Saturday, and Sunday really is largely, uh, but even other, other, other times of, of the year, there, there, is, there is no organized team sport in the United States that's indifferent to the weekly calendar. Uh, and that entertainment is, synchron is synchronized. But so many of us outside of sports um, consume entertainment asynchronously. Mm -hmm whether it's TikTok or Netflix or, or, or this podcast, um, uh, we're not doing it at the same time. So the week is no longer useful. So that's one. The other is electronic calendaring. Um, one of the great utilities of the week ha has been the fact that uh, we can plan an activity uh, and make it both, make the appointment both memorable and unlikely to collide with other appointments uh, if we peg it to a day of the week. And not only can you and I do that, but we can do that with strangers. I can announce that, you know, my bar is going to have trivia night, you know, on Thursdays and know that that's a useful thing. Okay. So if now though, our, our phones and our electronic calendars can communicate with each other, you and I can make a schedule of meetings and my bar could create trivia night for, you know, uh, for it's, it's, it's faithful, it's faithful regulars without any mnemonic intervention uh, uh, or complicated coordination. It just will populate calendars. That doesn't happen yet, especially not with the bars, but it does actually happen with, with, with meetings. Uh, I'm on committees where sometimes they'll say, here's the schedule for the semester when we're going to meet. It's not even the same day of the week. I mean, it's a mistake that they do that because our teaching schedules are pegged to the week. So this would take a long time, or I'm giving like block scheduling in schools. A lot of schools, um, high schools, and even uh, middle schools have gone to block scheduling as a way to solve certain kinds of problems that are uh, uh, curricular problems created by, the, by having the same uh, class schedule every Tuesday or every Wednesday. Block scheduling, I think, can only work with electronic calendars because it's really hard for students and parents and teachers to remember when each class is but mm -hmm. the electronic calendar can do that for you and so there are all of which is to say there are reasons to think that that uh, many of the functions that the week has played um uh will be will be less useful or less necessary with time and then of course there is work from home um and uh which not only means that traffic patterns don't have the same weekly significance. It also means that many of us are working remotely. So we're in a different time zone and sometimes a different day. 
So and if you're working with someone across the international dateline, then it actually is a different weekday typically. So, um, and all, 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 of, all, of, all of these things could attenuate. Uh, the main argument people have made is that 24-hour uh, shopping and, and, and seven-day shopping and, and, and uh, general accessibility through the internet of, of most of the activities that we used to only be able to do in certain days of the week will make us care less about the week. So, that's, so those are all the reasons why, yeah, you could expect it to go away. On the other hand, um, because the week has sunk its teeth into so many parts of us and, 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 anch and dropped anchors in so many parts of, of, of our lives, I think it's a little bit hard to, uh, to say that uh, the loss of one or two or even 10 of those functions is necessarily going to unmoor us from, from, from the week. Uh, the week historically has proven remarkably easy to implant and remarkably difficult to uproot. There aren't really historical examples of people losing the week, whereas there are amazing historical examples of societies like Japan adopting a seven day week uh, comprehensively at a very fast rate. So, so um, there's nothing in the larger history of the week to, to suggest that it's going away. I've just given some reasons to think that its function might change or weaken. And then during the pandemic sh shutdown, I became I became convinced that, that at least in the short term, people are so attached to the week um, that uh, so the pandemic sh uh, shutdown led uh, you know dislodged us from other rhythms much more powerfully day and night, um, time of year, you know all these annual things that didn't happen or the baseball season or prom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then and then you were in the same place during the day as you were in, in at night and. So it, it really ought to dislodge those rhythms. But instead, when people come, wanted to complain about their temporal disorientation, they always said, I don't know what the other week it is. So to me, that showed that it's not just practical things that make us feel like to know our place in time, we need to know this Thursday. It just has become fundamental to our sense of temporal emplacement to know that it's Thursday. Um, and, and that's why we complained about Blur's Day during the, the shutdown of twenty of 2020. So, so I'm, I'm, I'd say a little bit less uh, uh, convinced that, that the week is, is going anywhere than I was maybe in 2019. And as you point out at the very end of your book, <clears throat> if the week does go away, then something else mu must have happened that would be even more fundamentally alienating, <laughs> dislocating, yeah, because that so. it would be a seismic shift. Yeah. It really is so much part of, of, of our, of our, of our connection to one another and our sense of our place in the world. It really is. And your book uh, really reveals that to us in remarkable ways. It's called The Week, A History of the Unnatural Rhythms That Made Us Who We Are. It's published by Yale University Press. And our author, is, it, the author is with us, David Henkin. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank this you has so been much. Great. Really a great conversation and a lovely way to spend a Thursday afternoon. The hardest working producer and engineer in show business, the producer of this podcast, the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS snowshoe kickball team, is our very own Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our director of communications and staff pediatrician is Keith N. Stripes Dragero. The director of the GHS historical marker Lunatics Anonymous Mental Health Recovery Team is Brianna, don't call us, we'll call you, James. The captain of the GHS Italian wine tasting team is Rebecca EBR Bertina. Our GHS bouncer is Greg the Enforcer Durkin. Guest accommodations this week provided by the Horseshoe Road Inn. The director of the GHS Civil War Beard Division is Nate Brickwall Jackson Peterson. Our off the Eaton Path fact checker is Ella Fino. The manager of the GHS help desk is Don Botherme. The GHS opera critic is Barbara Seville. The Off the Deaton Path stock market predictor is Luigi Board. Our director of employee loyalty is Upton Leftus. Our staff layoff specialist is Harry Verderci, assisted by layoff counselor Oscar LaVista. Our Off the Deaton Path HR director is Stella Payne Diaz, assisted by deputy HR director Royal Payne Diaz, accompanied by our HR intern this year, Sasha Payne Diaz. Our GHS military history advisor is Major Payne Diaz. The official Off the Deaton Path dry cleaner is Preston Creases. The GHS Russian intern this year is Igor Beaver. The Off the Deaton Path Elvis impersonator is Amal Shookup. Our staff director of Three Stooges Studies is Lee Iapoka. 
Dr. Todd Gross's personal eBay specialist is Selma Junkoff, and our Off the Deaton Path martini mixer, thank you very much, is Olive Twist. You can find our podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. There's no hiding from this, including now on YouTube and YouTube Music. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at our recently redesigned website. Check it out, georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Be sure and like Off the Deaton Path on Facebook as well. Please also visit deatonpath.georgiahistory.com to find Off the Deaton Path. Check out dispatches from Off the Deaton Path, my blog, and similar time-bending podcasts like this one. Stay safe, stay strong. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>